two tough acts to follow, and I feel my story is a mixture of the two in, in this respect, that our first speaker was a man who was kind enough to tell us about skinny dipping in cold water, and therefore someone who didn't mind telling us a little bit about his own shortcomings. The second speaker, weirdly enough, mentioned the subject of my own reflections, which was the age of Mr. Ratan Tata. And so this is a mixture of my own shortcomings and a story about the age of Mr. Ratan Tata. And it began with a reflection about the worst place that your mobile phone could go off. And I'm sure that you could think of many places on a holiday where it would be inappropriate for your mobile phone to go off. But for me, the, the place that it happened was on a quiet morning in December 2012, in the middle of Pench Tiger Reserve in Madhya Pradesh. Now, my wife and I had traveled there uh, the day before, and we'd arrived at a beautiful lodge. Uh, I was also, like Suhel, uh, accepting freebies, because in my job as the Mumbai bureau chief of the Financial Times, you get... You, Ah, oh, come on, Suhel, you know how many freebies you accept. So. <laughs> you're, the, you're, you're the king of freebies. Now, normally as, a, no, normally as a journalist, you're not meant to accept freebies, but travel journalism is a special branch of journalism in which institutional corruption is entirely accepted. <laughs> indeed, indeed, almost entirely encouraged, as long as you have a small asterisk at the bottom of your piece saying hospitality provided by such and such a travel agent at this extraordinary amount of, of money. Which is good because it encourages you to stay at the most exorbitantly expensive places. So we were staying at the uh, Tiger Lodge of the Taj Hotel, uh, 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 which, which costs so much money that I can't even begin to bear to repeat how much Suhel didn't pay for the same experience. <laughs> We'd arrived there, and at lunchtime, We'd headed off into the park. Uh, any of you who haven't done this, you arrive at the entrance, you get in a jeep, uh, you have a guide. Our guide was named Kasim. You sit in the back of the jeep. This being the Taj, it was a very nice jeep. They gave you a blanket in case your knees got cold. There was tiffin in case you got hungry. They offered you drinks, non-alcoholic, but nonetheless. And you purred off, full of optimism, into the park thinking that this was going to be the day you were going to see one of the great sights. You see a speck of black and orange in the distance, and then suddenly, padding into view, there would be a magnificent tiger, full of optimism. So the way this works, for those of you who haven't done it, is the Jeep ambles off into the park, and you drive around, and, and then the driver will stop. And you'll pause, and it'll be completely silent. And what they're listening to is for something called alarm calls, which are other animals off in the distance. And the alarm calls go off when the tigers are around. So you're listening for alarm calls because that might indicate what the tigers are. So it's dead quiet. The driver has turned off his Jeep. We're listening. And that is when my mobile phone goes off. So I thought, oh, Christ, what's going on here? And I pick it up. And it's a friend of mine who works for the Tartars. And I think, OK, I better take this. And, it, and, and my friend on the other end of the line, so he's from Mumbai, so his first word is boss. <laughs> and he says, boss, this is a total disaster. Everybody here is completely losing it. What are we going to do? And it's at that point that I realized that the only thing worse than your phone going off in a Tiger Reserve is your phone not going off in a Tiger Reserve? Because it's at that moment that the Jeep goes off and the phone goes dead. So all of this began about 12 months earlier, roughly. That was when, as Vikram said, I arrived in India from London to be the Mumbai bureau chief for the Financial Times. That was the very beginning of 2012. And from the moment I arrived, I knew that the most important thing that was going to happen in 2012 for a global business newspaper was the retirement of the great business leader of corporate India, Mr. Ratan Tata, who was due to shuffle off amid fireworks and laudatory editorials and general praise 
in December 2012. And so I had spent the year desperately attempting to ingratiate myself with the Tartars. Suhel Seth had in some ways helped and advised me in this task and I'd flattered and deceived and begged and asked, could I possibly, when the great man is about to retire, could I have that interview? And they'd said, no, 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 he's not gonna give any interviews. And then eventually through a weird set of circumstances, he said, yes, he said, yes, he would agree to do a slot called lunch with the FT, which for any of you who know our newspaper is the greatest slot that the FT offers. Every Saturday you have lunch with some famous luminary. And so, uh, and, and so I was gonna go and have lunch with Mr. Ratan Tata. So I was very excited. So a few weeks before this episode with the Tigers, I had trooped into Bombay House, the Tartars' old headquarters in South Mumbai. It wasn't going to be a lunch with the FT. Sadly, it was chai with the FT. So we got an hour. He was very busy. But I got to go and have tea with the great man. And so we had a nice chat. You know, he, I'd met him before. He's a very, very nice guy. I went in there with no, no malice intended. And actually, he liked me. Or at least he had, uh, I learned he'd given me the interview because of a strange thing that had happened with the stray dogs that live in the headquarters of the Tata group. Now, Suhel again knows about this. If you walk into this headquarters, there are stray dogs lying around in the entrance. And this happened because Mr. Tata in one rainy monsoon day in legend had said, if any stray dogs walk into our headquarters, then they must be allowed to stay because it's unfair. Mr. Tata loves dogs. He's got two Alsatians. So he said, let the dogs in. And they came in and they stayed. And so in the, the headquarters of India's premier company, there are the fattest slumdog millionaires that you will ever see, who legend has it even get their breakfast cooked by the chefs in Bombay House. And the fact that I'd written a nice story about these dogs apparently had mildly endeared me to Mr. Tata. And so he'd agreed to the interview. Anyway. Cut a long story short, we, we chatted and I asked him obvious questions about, you know, how is the business going and what about the disaster of the Tata Nano and should they have bought Tata Steel and what did he think of the government and what about his helicopters and did he still fly his jet plane and what was he going to do with his retirement and all that kind of stuff. And in the middle of it, he actually was quite critical of the government and this surprised me. If you remember, this was the heart of UPA too, bit of a disaster, you know, Manmohan Singh at his absolute low point, corruption scandals, nothing going on. And normally Indian business leaders are completely cowardly about this, you know, they, they will talk to the government as if the government is wonderful. You very rarely find anyone being critical of Mr. Modi. But that day, Mr. Tata was, seemed to be in the mood to talk. And he wasn't directly critical of the prime minister, but he was very critical of India's system of government. He said some harsh things about many industries, about how Tata was having to invest abroad. And I walked out of that interview thinking that that was the point. That was why he'd given me this interview. And so in addition to writing out my lunch with the FT, I wrote up a news story uh, saying Mr. Tata had been critical of India's government for not doing enough to help investment. And I was pretty excited. I thought I got a good scoop here. This could, you know, this could make my career as a journalist. My office in London were pretty excited. And we, we put this story in the newspaper globally uh, on December the 6th. That was the Wednesday of that week. And I, w I woke up, I w went to bed. I woke up the next morning. I thought, okay, this is gonna be big. And what happened? Nothing, absolutely nothing. That Wednesday, I realized that nobody in India reads the Financial Times. <laughs> Nothing at all. And I was quite disappointed. I thought, this is my great scoop, Mr. Tata. Not only do I get to have lunch with a great man, but he gave me this great scoop. He criticized the government. Nothing happened. Anyway, then things began to change. One day later, the Indian papers began to pick up on this story. And so there were stories on the Thursday in some of the, in some of the Indian papers, uh, the Business Standard, the Economic Times, but they weren't quite the same story. My story had been carefully worded, carefully caveated to say that Mr. Tata criticized India's system of government. And they were, it was very balanced, nuanced. Translated through the Indian press, the story turned into 
evil English Financial Times journalist tempts Mr. Tata to slam Manmohan Singh. Yeah, you can see where this is heading. Then comes the Friday, and the story is taken up in Parliament. There are questions in the House as the then BJP opposition asks an embarrassed Congress government why the English evil journalist had tempted the great man of corporate India to slam Manmohan Singh. And that was the day that we headed off to the Tiger Reserve, and I thought, okay, well, I'll just wait until all this blows over. But then it was on the Saturday morning, it was on the Saturday morning that Mr. Tata's office had apparently got a call from the Prime Minister's office saying, what on earth do you think you're doing? And it was at that point that I got a call from Mr. Tata's office saying, boss, this is a complete disaster. Everybody's completely losing it. What are we going to do? And that was when the phone went dead. And so there we were, you remember, in the Jeep, total silence, occasionally driving around, setting the car down. Any of you been to Pench, the scene, it, it's not like Rantambor where you have these wide open vistas and rocks. It's heavily forested and you're driving around little paths. And so Kasim took us around. I was at this point kind of quite freaked out. Kasim takes us around, we see mongoose, we see some deer we see what are called pug marks, which are the, the marks made by the tigers, which I increasingly came to believe were made by guides in the park with tiger-shaped paw prints on sticks to convince gullible tourists that there might be tigers around. As some of you will know, there are a few tiger reserves in India that are famous for the fact that they have had no tigers in them for many years, and it was unclear whether we were in one of them. And so we drove around and, and my phone kept coming in and out of signal. So the first thing that happened was when the signal came back, I tried to call my friend back and totally failed. I couldn't get through. We kind of get a few crackled words to find out what was going on. What was this panic that was gripping the Tatars about what was happening? And then the next thing that would happen is the phone would go dead and we'd have to move to text messages. And so we moved through the Tiger Reserve moving through the, the, the jeep, roaring around, and then becoming very quiet, listening, and suddenly you'd get back into service, and the text messages would start coming in, chung, 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 chung. As more people started to text, there were friends who were texting saying, my God, what have you done? You've got everyone criticizing Mr. Tata. No one's ever gonna speak to you again. There was my friend in Bombay House saying, boss, this is a disaster. What are we going to do? Suddenly, I started getting calls from Indian media, the gist of which was, would you like to come on our show this evening and explain why it is you, the evil English journalist, have tempted the great saint, Mr. Tata, to slam Manmohan Singh? An invitation that I was quite pleased to be able to reject. And that was the tenor of our day. We went around what was meant to be one of the great memorable experiences, entirely ruined by my phone going off and then my phone not working again. And we got back in the evening and I thought, I was pretty unhappy about this and I, I sort of reflected, I suppose, on my experience in, in three different ways. The first of which was that in a weird way as a journalist, you're meant to enjoy this. You're meant to enjoy the kind of the thrill of the chase. And I, I, I got a little bit of empathy for what it feels like to be on the other side when suddenly you, as opposed to the people that you're writing about, find yourself at the center of what was a relatively minor media storm, but in my experience, one of the, one of the larger ones. The second was simply that I didn't really like that element of, of journalism. That the, 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 some of my colleagues at my newspaper, I don't know if any of the rest of you are journalism, they love this. They love the notion that you are you're breaking big news and causing controversy. You're making people angry. You're, you're, you're chasing people down. But I, I decided on that day that I didn't really like that very much. And that maybe I would have been better off being a travel journalist after all. And then I suppose my third reflection was that somehow even the Tigers decided that as an evil English journalist who had tempted 
the great saint of corporate India to slam Man Moan Singh that I was to be punished on that day and the two subsequent days that we spent wandering around fruitlessly trying to see tigers. Because they say of these Indian tiger reserves that many of them are reserves in the sense that the tigers are very reserved. <laughs> and so over the course of those three days, we didn't see any tigers at all. And I think I thought that was because the tigers were punishing me for my own shortcomings. So thank you very much. That's my story.